Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. We've all been at the grocery store, going through the aisles, we get to the fruits and vegetables, we pick up two items. Wait, why is this one a dollar more? It's organic. Why is organic so expensive? Why is organic such a fad? Well, today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to find out. But before we get into that, Nick, how you doing? What are you drinking? Doing great. Drinking a Coors. What about you, Mike? I am drinking a 1835, that's not the year, just the name, bourbon, and Nick, we have a special guest on today. I guess we do. We got Trent here with us. Trent, what do you do? And how are you related to the organic industry? Hey, thanks for having me. I am currently, I'm drinking a Modelo and I'm going to be drinking some Basil Hayden's the farther we get into this. So, um, currently I work as a field man uh, in Washington for a fruit warehouse, fruit packing warehouse for apples and cherries. And basically my job is to go get contracts with independent growers and get them to bring their fruit to my warehouse to get it packed. Um, I deal both with conventional and organic um, orchards and pretty much it. From the earth to your, to your plate. So how long have you been doing this? I'm actually still pretty green at it. I <laughs> hit a year, <laughs> I, I hit a year of the job in February, so... Um, oh, nice. I did work in, I've been working in the Acma Valley for about three years now, though. I've been in hops and then I went into the orchards. I didn't actually think I was going to get into the fruit business, but I did. And I ended up loving the heck out of it. So, um, it's got a, a lot to learn. And especially when you're talking about different varieties of apples and cherries. So it's always, it's, a, it's always different learning every day. So yeah. And that's Is in that the... Washington. I was, I'm surprised that fruit is grown in Washington. Yeah, we're the, um, uh, I think we outproduce California now in cherries. So we're the highest producing cherry state. And then the United States is the highest cherry producer behind Chile. Funny enough, Chile just thwomps us. So, but yeah, they, and then apples were the biggest apple growing state too. And you got a couple other states that compete with us, but I mean, we, we're pretty much the majority. Oregon's got a small percentage, and then you have a couple states like New York and those guys out on the east side. So, yep. so is that what you mainly grow is cherries and apples? Yeah, we do deal with some pears and stuff. A couple of my growers grow like apricots and peaches, but what my warehouse specializes in is in cherries and apples. So we do facilitate some uh, pear packers, um, or sorry, pear, uh, pear growers. And we send that up to one of our other warehouses, but mainly my my expertise is in apples and cherries, so that's what I deal with every day. And what percentage of those growers are growing organic apples, and what are <clears throat> growing conventional? Well, in the industry right now, you can probably see it, there's not much of an organic market in cherries, and if there is, it's on the front end and it's gone within about a week. <laughs> so. Uh, most of those guys that are in the front end of the market, so the early early areas, right? Um, they typically fulfill the organic market, and there's a couple in between later in the season, but there's it's just not really there. The apple market's probably about the organic market for that's probably about 20% of the industry. Also, not that much, but I mean, again, it's there. And if you can produce the right kind of fruit, then you can get in the organic market and you get the premium. But the thing with the organic market when it comes to apples, it's very variety dependent. Some varieties don't move as well into the marketplace as others, and some do better in organics than others do. Like organic honey crisps actually do a pretty good job right now, and then organic grannies just are flat, like Granny Smiths. They they don't do a very good job in the organic market right now. And I think part of that is that honey crisps, all in all, are just a good apple. 
that people want to eat. I think that's what most of the organic buyers look for. And they don't really look at a Granny Smith and really think, oh, well, that's a good eating apple. Although it, it does pretty well in the conventional market. I just don't think it's there for organic people. So Before we get too far ahead, we keep throwing the word organic around. Uh, for me, organic has always been no human interaction. So, But I know that's quite different from what is actually done. In your experience, what is organic in your world? Well, I'm I'm just going to take it all the way to the USDA. I, I got the organic handbook pulled up just so we can get the definitions out of the way and then we can start rolling over it. The USDA defines organic agriculture as the application of a set of cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that support the cycling of on-farm resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Uh, these include maintaining or enhancing soil and water quality, conserving wetlands, woodlands, wildlife, and avoiding use of synthetic fertilizers, sewage, sludge, ir uh, irrigate, radiation, and genetic engineering. With that being said, though, there are a lot of caveats to that. There's some specifics that can get rolled out there. And some other parts of the USDA handbook, they talk about organic agriculture being syn synthetic pesticide-free, which isn't actually true. They have a couple, they have a list under that that says with the exception of these products. So there are synthetic pesticides and um, fertilizers in organic agriculture. Basically, I would identify organic as focusing more on, I don't want to say sustainability because conventional agriculture does a pretty good job at that, but they focus more on deriving their protections and, and applications from natural resources straight out. Um, so they wouldn't use anything like gly glyphosate or something like that, even though alcohol is also chemically created for, you know, for commercial production. I mean, it, it, it they just have certain things that they don't think uh, have the same effect on, on organic agriculture or their environment. So there's exceptions. Yeah, I, I got to imagine that like ammonia, which is kind of in a lot of fertilizers, is kind of natural that just the nitrogen to get the soil up i can't imagine that being too controversial for being organic or non-organic yeah they use so the uh nitrogen they are a little more tough on the synthetic nitrogen that's why you see that's why you see a lot more manure used and they also have a whole a whole handbook behind the manure because manure can be misused. You can get raw manure, contamination, water, and such like that. So they have a whole set of standards for that too. But typically see you see manure or, or animal fertilizers right out of the bank used instead of synthetic nitrogen. Interesting. Interesting. So it's, it's I guess, trying to use a byproduct to make it more natural. But every time everyone hears organic, they just think it's straight out of the ground. But they're not realizing that there's... Other things afoot, just not as <clears throat> in depth as some other agricultural practices. Interesting. Yeah, I like to see organic as it, it really is a different farming program, especially nowadays. It's not so much just trendy; it's actually another form of agriculture or, or, or agricultural program, right? So, so they really do focus more on in increasing the biodiversity in their soil. They increase. They really focused on mulches and such like that. They just kind of get away from the chemical applications. Their whole thing is sustainability, which in my opinion is, it's a little, I mean, you have a lot of sustainability and, and conventional too. I mean, that's what every grower wants to be is sustainable. But I, I, I think they really just try to focus on the, on the clean, you know, natural resources used in the process. So. And uh, so I had a question on like the amount of, of inputs you need are like, what's a, we don't, use organic pesticides so what's are the price of organic pesticides a lot higher and what's the do you get used at a higher rate like what's kind of the comparison between treatments from an organic versus a conventional block for uh, like your normal year yeah no that's a good question the um so in terms of inputs i don't have the actual sh like a sheet in front of me with the prices and such but i know from working with my growers typically they are paying a higher price for organic applications whether that be um, protection agents you know for uh, like fungicide or not fungicide but a f fungal protection or something like that uh, they use sulfur sulfur oxide and stuff like that that's typically more expensive and on the other question of how much they they apply it they do typically apply, do more applications in organic so just to give you an idea they do find uh, a little less 
pesticide residue in organics than they do in conventional. There was actually a paper done a couple years ago, and we heard about it in my one of my pesticide classes in college. I can't remember the name of the paper, but uh, it said that the uh, residue left from organics is only about four or five parts per million less than that of conventional. So if you're talking about pesticide reduction, I mean, when you're going to buy that organic product, it's not that... It's not that less that that much more pesticides a residue in conventional. So I mean, we can talk more about why you you pay that much more for organic, you know, further on in the discussion. But I think I think especially when it comes to prices and such, the inputs really drive the price up because you're applying sometimes two or three times more than you would in conventional, even though it's a different chemical makeup. It's still the same intended use. It just conventional does a lot better job of covering area. They have a lot more effective pesticides and stuff like that. So out of curiosity with traditional pesticides, like I know there's different features like aerial sprays, like, uh, uh, you know, manual labor of just going out there with uh, pressurized bottles and spraying them for organic pesticide. Is that the same process as that can be used or do they have to have their own processes? In terms of application, you mean like the actual? Yeah, just, yeah distributing the uh, chemicals for organic. You, you're talking about like actual, the spraying yeah. process. Do you, do you guys use blowers? Okay, yeah, so, but we do use what's called a fan sprayer and it's, uh, it's, it's literally what you think. It's a fan on the back of a tank and it blows the the chemical or whatever application you're doing uh up and around so as you're going down these roads just think of like a of a trellis system and you got rows so so the apples apple trees or cherry trees are going straight up right so as you go down this fan sprayer is is blowing up into the up into the trees and then going on top of them and and, and getting coverage on on the very top at the same time because it's all it's circular right so that's kind of the projection they use and that's and that's used in both organic and conventional the spray process is the same for for the actual chemical application i'm a mechanical engineer i have no idea what happens in the farmland so this is all i might ask some dumb questions but luckily that's no that's okay here. no fan, fan sprayers are pretty are pretty unique. I didn't know about them too until I got into hops, and they use them in hops too. But it's really any kind of agriculture that seems to go up. <laughs> so, <laughs> really, or orchards or hops, a lot of your specialty crops like that. That's that's where they use fan sprayers. I don't think I've ever seen them used in field crops or anything because there's really not any point, right? Your their tip, field crops are typically lower, and you got taller sprayers that just go right over them, and you don't have to cover up and above you, you know. So, but yeah. So I got a question for you Trent so it seems like some plants are just made to be grown organic like mm -hmm. for example I go and buy mint for mojitos all the time and I can only find it organically but it sounds like apples is one of those where it's more of a challenge like I mean you're saying you got 20 percent of them is it uh I mean do you think there's from the crops that you grow like that there you found other crops that are just like super easy to do organically or I mean it doesn't sound like apples is one of those but and cherries doesn't sound like is either. Well, part part of the thing is it's it's partially market driven. So our our generations, just to give you a heads up on the market of apples and cherries, our generation is heavily cosmetic driven. When you look at an apple, any marks or anything like that typically drop it down a grade. So when you get into organics, organics are kind of when you're talking about organics, you have a smaller toolbox, okay, to work with in terms of pro uh, protectants and just chemicals in general. And so typically I see a lot more scarring and a lot more damage in, in organics. And when we're talking about packouts, packout is a, it's a sheet that you get after your apples are packed and it shows you, and then when I talk about packout percentage, that's how many apples got packed. And then the other percentage, the cold percent percentage is what got rejected because they were too low of a grade or they had too much damage on them, right? So organics typically have a lower pack out on average just because they typically are uglier fruit. And is that the fault of the grower? Not not really. It's just you have less to work with. And, and typically the premium that comes with organic, if you can hit the right market, I mean, nullifies that anyways. So it's in certain instances, it is worth it to grow organic apples if if you can do it right. I, I think I think in terms of organics, yeah. I I mean 
me myself, I don't know if I grow organic apples, but I got some really good growers that are really good at it and they get some higher pack out percentages, but on average it's lower than conventional. So with that difference of packing and because of cosmetics, are organic farmers still making a good profit comparatively? Like, cause obviously if apples are 20% of the market organic and the other 80% more conventional farming is the cost and the profit still the same for both sides of the feet coin? Um, it totally, uh, it's going to depend on, on how the year went to, and there's so many factors contributing to that. So if you can, if you can farm a good apple in organics, and again, this is heavily variety dependent. So, and, and different varieties hit a different market because of when they grow, right? So if you can hit the right market and you can grow a good apple as an organic grower, you're going to outpace the conventional guys. So we'll typically still take organics. It's just, it's just, that's kind of a rule for us in general. If, if, if there's no market for their apple, we won't take it. You have a lot, you have a lot more room to work with if you're in organic and you can go down to conventional. Um, the problem with that is that you just farmed a apple organic and it's not going to look very pretty <laughs> so uh, i i think in my opinion you know for conventional so you might not get that you're not going to get that premium price in conventional so the growers can decide by year so it's not like once this orchard's dedicated to being organic it has to stay organic for you know however many years no so so yeah they, if they want to sell organic they they do have to be certified organic and, and sorry I, I i need to specify on that so when <clears throat> so when they produce organic, they have to get certified that way to sell organic. That doesn't mean that they can't sell that fruit conventional. So, so you can go down, you can kind of go downgrade, right? So if you sell, there's no restrictions on conventional fruit, but you couldn't go the other way. Does that kind of make sense? So in my mind, it's kind of like a, a lot of whiskey and bourbon makers. Like you have to age your whiskey. It has to be like age seven years or something like that. So a lot of whiskey makers make vodka until their licensing is ready to sell or their batch is ready to sell. It sounds kind of similar to me where you make something in the meantime until you get the licensing. Yeah, yeah, actually that's that's a pretty common practice. That's a good example. A lot of these guys will farm it organic. So so just a background on organic certification to actually go organic. And I, I don't know if this, this isn't just the orchard industry. I know this is a couple other crops and I'm not sure if it covers all crops in general, but you have to farm a, a crop for three years with organic standards, right? So you have to use organic practices in there. And you have to do that for three years to actually sell it organic. So for that three years, you can still sell it conventional, right? You still you still have a crop, and you can sell it or, uh, conventional. But on on that that third year, you can finally, or after that third year, you can finally sell it con, uh, organic. But you have to be doing that organic practice for three years. So no glyphosate, no a lot of your synthetic chemicals besides the one I'll list later, you know, stuff like that. So. Does that kind of make sense? It does. I'm also very surprised that glyphosate's on the list after doing research on it and how quickly it dispenses and is almost a non-factor. I'm very surprised it's not in the organic list of okay chemicals. Well, fun fact about that too, and 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 a lot of crops, even if it's not technically allowed in organics, they still they still find glyphosate residue that they test for every year, so they still <laughs> find it. So. I'm not saying that means that the growers are are necessarily cheating the system because they, they they have a pretty they have a pretty strict certification process. I mean, they look over all your spraying records and everything. I mean, you can't really slip by on that stuff, and and it, it it'd be a pretty big deal if you if you tried. So I imagine that's got to be just like transportation residue or you know a, a adjacent crop kind of wind picks up one time doing the fans and it just gets on you just something out of your control. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. Those are some factors that can totally contribute to that. That is correct. So so let's talk about unless you had something else, Trent. Why uh, why organic such a big thing right now? Well, I, you know, actually, that's partially why I'm I'm gonna enjoy sitting here talking to you guys about that because I, I see it from the grower's perspective of just filling a market need because at the end of the day, I mean, we have this demand, and Nick would know this, but you know, me and Nick are are living in West coast states right now. And, and they're, pro you know, I don't know about nationally, but organics over here is a big hot debate. You also have a lot of demand in like, like the West side of Washington and Oregon and South Southern California. Um, just those demographics prefer organics. But I, th I think that when it comes down to that, 
that discussion. It's it's just primarily moved by those certain areas. I, I don't know why people buy organics from that from that end of things. I think part of it is not knowing exactly what organics encompass. I, I actually believe that a lot of people would not buy as much organic if they actually knew what was went into um, organic production. Like I said, you can still use pesticides in organics. And a lot of people I talk to that like to eat organic don't really know that. And they also don't know that it's not GMO free. They also don't know that you can use a certain chemicals in there that they're applied three times more than they are in you know conventional. So it's just certain things like that that you just need to help educate people with. And, and I get it, there's a lot of disconnect Actually, I think that's mainly the issue is there's a lot of disconnect from the grower to the consumer, especially when you're talking about uh, west side versus east side, Washington, Oregon. And you see a lot of that. Yeah, I couldn't tell you how many sources I came across that are like organic means non means uh, pesticide free. It's like those are two entirely separate things. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had to do some digging, too. When I knew that it wasn't pesticide free, but I also didn't know that it necessarily stated it was synthetic chemicals that weren't synthetic pesticides that weren't allowed. And then they have that whole list that's like, well, but we have these <laughs> that you can use. So I had to do some digging for that. But it's just it's just interesting that they still have that list of, of chemicals you can still use. Because the whole idea behind it is that they're trying to get chemicals, or not necessarily chemicals, but, but um, applications that are derived from natural resources. But you still have to do a lot of chemical processes for some of those. You know, alcohol, like I said, is one of them. So even though it's a naturally occurring thing, you have to go through a chemical process to produce that commercially. So Yeah, because my wife, she had an internship working at a place that created different fertilizers and they make a, you know, the organic version of that same fertilizer. It's the same chemical compound. It's just the mm -hmm. source of the chemicals is organic. And it was like four or five times as much. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Nick, do you use any organics in, in the forest industry? Or any kind of, no. did, I was gonna. I, I was just curious if they had any kind of certifications, or. <laughs> but I was just curious if they had any like, you know, how, there's a lot of just quirky parts of markets nowadays that just go for either organic or wholesome or sustainable stuff. I, I don't know if they put any labels on trees. I know we, you're not producing. We have labels, but it's not for that. Mike, you're right. Fire, I guess, could be considered a natural pesticide that we use. Get the napalm out. That's well, organic, right? <laughs> After you had an entire uh, episode about bombing, bombing yeah, yeah, hippies bombing, or something like that, bombing the, uh, <laughs> bombing the invasive species. Oh yes, that. Yeah. Yeah. No hippies, so, invasive species, same thing, right? Yeah, our licensing is basically just to make sure that we're sustainable. So it's like, don't harvest more than you cut. Don't cut within a certain amount of length of the stream. Don't cut more than X amount of acres. And it's fun fact, compared to the organic, it doesn't really make our wood that much more, it doesn't really make it a premium good compared in the United States uh, compared to that certifi same certification in like Europe or somewhere else. In the United States, gotcha. we don't really care as much, but pretty much everyone has it now. Bringing it back to organic food, I do have a question because you brought up in the beginning that the agriculture police, I, I lack of better terms, uh, to term organic is not using like CRISPR for genetic engineering, but yet a lot of organic material has GMOs. So <clears> you are correct. I'm a little confused. So are you allowed to cross pollinate and modify the plant but just not genetically modify the plant actually you can use gmos and organics so like i said you know with the whole synthetic uh, pesticide thing that it said on there it's it's uh, in that list it has some of those gmos that you can use like i'm pretty sure you can still use certain like roundup resistant plants in organic uh, agriculture even if you're not applying uh, glyphosate <laughs> But it's like I, I'm pretty sure on that, which just throws me for a loop. But but you you can use GMOs a again. It's just it's just one of those labeling things that I mean. So the USDA is accurate because they leave it. They they have that list of allowed products, but but on that label, you know, people a lot of people just don't know the difference because that's what they think it is. They think it's GMO free. And and I'm sure you guys could do a whole another episode on GMOs. It's you know. That's that's a whole other thing to go into. So well, I'm a fan of GMOs because mainly because I don't like seeing people starve to death. But it's so interesting to me that 
organics yeah. still allow GMOs. It seems very that seems very contradictory to what the two, <clears throat> what I think organic in my mind comes to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of got that from it too. I, I actually kind of more like to describe organics as it's like we're taking seventy years of agricultural science and progress. And kind of just tossing it down the <laughs> down the trash can, <laughs> because you talk about like yeah GMOs and you talk about stuff like Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution, you know, and you feel like you're kind of taking all that and just tossing it away. But here's what I will give to organics: they, in their own right, in the last 20 years, have kind of created their own progression of technologies to use in organics. So I, I don't necessarily think they they. I'm, I'm not convinced that they've kind of just taken an entire step back to, you know, we can't use any modern technology for agriculture because they actually do a very good job of imploring more cultural and mechanical controls. So they do, a, uh, they look for more resistant varieties and they also typically, you know, they kind of go in line with some of those no-till guys. They focus more on uh, O-Horizon production and just again soil biodiversity and they just focus more on the cultural part of it and they also use a lot more biocontrol so they like to have a lot can try and facilitate more predatory insects and spiders in in their orchards so a lot of people use ladybugs a lot more in orchards and hops because they'll kill aphids. When I walk into orchard, organic orchards, the fact that my face hits a freaking spider web every two seconds pisses me off, but I get it. <laughs> they're, they're doing their job, and, and, but you don't see that in conventional. I know some people might argue, well, that, that means it's bad. Well, not necessarily. It's just a different type of control. It doesn't mean that that crop is any less or more healthy for you. It's just that spiders are used as a control more in organics. And I, I think the synthetic chemicals that are using conventional don't foster a very good environment for those kinds of controls like spiders and, and and ladybugs they're still there but i don't think they foster the same environment i am so happy you said ladybugs i've been saying ladybugs since the very first episode of this podcast and you made my day by saying the word ladybugs well well you're welcome mike <laughs> no problem <laughs> yeah so i got a quick question with the the biological controls just for and this is probably because forestry is usually like 10 to 20 years behind agriculture because it takes a while to adopt your guys' cool new toys. Mm -hmm. What's like the response time? Like say, so do you, like with ladybugs, control aphids, are you just going to, beginning of the season, get a bunch of ladybugs to keep in there or if it's, you know, flowers that attract the ladybugs? Or if you have like a booming ladybug population... <coughs> How do you keep up? I guess it's probably easier to manage like an orchard than it is a forest, but what? Uh, okay. How, what's like your time frame on that? I'm like, because you, you probably got to have a pretty quick, you know, you got to know the population of your pests mm -hmm. and then make a quick response. Yeah, that's yeah, that's accurate. So yeah, as as far as timing, I, I'm not an expert on this at all, but as, uh, I'm just thinking from a pest control standpoint, it's it's totally gonna depend on your crop and what timing that those pests that are specific to that crop typically come out. I know you can buy populations of ladybugs and set them out there. I'm not sure how feasible that is. I know for sure that a lot of what these orchards do is they just try to facilitate a, an environment where those ladybugs can thrive. So they kind of like invite them in, right? But I I, I, I have to do some more research on that. That's curious. It's a good question because I, I would think that you'd maybe want to buy some populations of ladybugs to get them introduced into that environment but i don't know how often that's done kind of picking back on nick's question for organic is it more monoculture for organic or is it still or is it more diverse cropping because i i imagine like ladybugs aren't always going after like the same species or simply having multiple cultures might allow certain spiders to breed and grow more because it attracts different fruits and flies etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm I'm just curious for the organic market. The organic market is it more monoculture or is it still uh, is it diverse? Are you talking about like um, orchards specifically or just in general? And you're talking uh, about let, like intercropping the, or crop rotation? Uh, let's start with orchards and let's just start with uh, just like a crop. Not let's go with the latter, not the crop rotation, but the other. Okay, the intercropping. They do a little bit of intercropping in hops, and and, and they they just put like different crops in in the in the middle between the rows. I mean, they just pretty much grow orchard grass in orchards. 
<laughs> but I mean, that's that's about it. I mean, that's really all you see. There's not any other kind of crops in there, and you can't rotate it, obviously. So that so that's why I was asking specifically. Um, you can't really just rotate a tree. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Nick. Really Nick, how easy is it to do that? <laughs> pretty easy we do it every uh 40 ish years oh yeah let's see <laughs> see maximum time you might be able to hit the organic market yeah no that's a good question too so you but. also mentioned how long a organic product will last when a i imagine it's the same for both but like if they have like marring or cosmetically they don't look good like they either get chopped up and go to frozen or some other marketplace for organic say cherries because you deal with cherries mm -hmm. what is the lifespan of organic versus non-organic you know i'm not sure about that in cherries how much of a difference that makes uh there are well, some products and apples there's a little bit of a difference. Like again, you can use, there's certain products you can use that increase the lifetime or the stability of, of the apple, especially in CA storage, which is, um, if you don't know, that's, um, that's uh, atmospheric storage. And that's, that's basically just cuts all the oxygen off from the room. So it keeps the apples from progressing in the, um, in terms of organic versus conventional, like I said, there's a couple products you can use that will increase their lifetime a little bit, but I mean, there's not too much of a difference. With cherries, though, cherries are kind of interesting because it's always you're always hauling ass on cherries, and maybe this is why they don't do a lot of in organic, uh, a lot of organic cherries is because cherries have like a one week, two week lifetime where you got it especially if you're going to export they have to have a certain firmness level otherwise they'll literally melt on the boat going to export because <laughs> they, they just they do they just they just get ripe that fast and with apples it's not the same thing really i mean they you know there's some and that's variety dependent i've had a pink lady apple sit on my counter for two months and nothing happened to it and then i had a honey crisp sit on there for a week and went just rotten pretty quick <laughs> so <laughs> but but the the pink lady is like a nuclear bomb of apples apples so can't really do much with it in terms of killing it <laughs> so <laughs> i now have a new favorite apple it's a good apple i'd I recommend it it's one of my favorite just curious what's your favorite apple variety to one to grow and two to eat i guess what's can they the, they can be the same do they have to be the same one no they can be different okay Okay, yeah, because my my favorite one to eat is probably the Honeycrisp, and that's probably going to be a lot of people. My favorite one to grow is the Granny. the The Honeycrisp is just a super good tasting apple. It's it's sweet. It's 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 soft enough to bite into. I hate growing it. It sucks. It was never meant to be grown. It was meant to be eaten. <laughs> I don't know how that's supposed to factor in, but it, it, there was a Mich I think it was a Michigan University of Michigan paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. And granted, this is like five or six years into us using this product or using uh, Honeycrisp and growing it. And it said that this apple is not meant to be grown, packed, or shipped, <laughs> only to be eaten. <laughs> We're like, well, hell, I wish we knew that five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> with the granny smiths they're my favorite to grow because they're just well and along with the pink ladies too they're just they're just hardy they're super hard to kill they the with the granny smith you can pick them for like a month so what i mean by that is is once it gets to this acceptable starch level for the um state grade that you can pick them you can take a month to pick those and they're not going to ripen that much on the tree other like honey crisp you got to pick them in a week or less or like a couple days otherwise they're going to start maturing really fast uh galas start cracking on the tree because they mature they ripen so fast and and once it cracks then that's a coal so so comparatively the granny is just awesome nothing really happens to it i mean the wind can beat it up and you got natural effects on it and stuff but the grannies are definitely the best to grow so this is kind of a left field question which i don't expect you to know the answer to but i just feel like asking uh for like grannies are the seeds like just for apples in general are the seeds saved by the farmer organically or are the seeds bought or uh more uh are you talking about the seeds for replanting or yes uh so typically trees are not planted by seeds anymore uh well i mean they are they're started in greenhouses like nursery companies so and they'll grow them for a year and then you go plant them for organically is that still done the same way in the greenhouses or is organically yes. a different process okay nope same process they grow them in a greenhouse for a year they call them starts and then you go plant them in the in the ground the next season and it's just it's just giving them a leg up i don't think i've ever seen an apple tree planted by seeds since i was a kid you know since like you plant them in your backyard <laughs> kind of thing but it's just it's just yeah they, they you buy them from nurseries and warehouses and stuff like that they go through 
and uh, do that. So I, I, I'm sure a grower will take seeds from his apples and go plant them in his backyard for his like personal trees, but you don't do that in commercial agriculture. So gotcha. And, and sorry, survive. I interrupted you there. <laughs> <laughs> survive is kind of the key point. Sorry. Yeah. What right. Trying to say? I'm trying to remember what I was trying to say. Oh yeah. Hey, we're talking about trees and you can't remember anything you want to say. Oh, I was going to say, I figured there'd be a lot of crossover here, even though it's tree fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I, my question was, what are your, your big pests that you guys deal with, whether it be like a wind event or insects? Like what are your, like if you had to say your big three pests, what are, what would those be? You said natural and, and, yeah, and insects. Yeah, whatever's okay. killing your crop. If I could cut the wind off from life, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I hate wind. It, it beats up apples and it's, it's super, super difficult to deal with come frost season. It can cause a couple issues. Sometimes it can be a saving grace, pushing warm warm air towards us but typically it screws us over with pushing cold air from another side or something like that but it just it just does a lot of damage to apples especially it it can hurt cherries pretty bad too i think the next one would probably be aphids aphids cause a lot of damage on the tree they're sucking insects so they can also be vectors for certain viruses so they're not a lot of fun and then the other one's a cherry fruit fly it sit, literally sits in the cherry as a larva and, and, and progresses in it at, at that stage and then eats the cherry from inside out, and you can see the exit holes on it. There's our, uh, some other fruit flies and stuff like that, but those are probably my top three. Gotcha. And you have organic and conventional responses to those those insects? Yeah, there's products for both. The, again, the organic's just not as aggressive is the word I'm looking for. It's just not as aggressive. Typically, a lot of these things are more protectants you're not looking for eradication that's just not a lot of products in general especially when you're talking viruses and, and fungus you're you're talking more protectants i mean there are a lot of pesticides you can use for killing insects in the orchard industry um, actually in cherries before we send them export we have fumigation rooms don't know the chemical they use for that off the top of my head but they will fume a room of cherries in it to make sure they kill off any any existing fruit fly larva that's in there. Sorry, for, yeah, fruit fly um, maggot would be the correct term, my bad. But No, you're giving me nightmare fuel enough. That's okay. I don't want to eat maggots, and now I'm thinking about <laughs> nothing but eating maggots. Well, that's why we fume him, Mike. <laughs> this is, don't this live is in Asia. I drink <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, man, what if uh, instead of the organic movement, we had a movement that people just didn't want to throw away, like, any food? And we just shipped all our all your like defect apples and stuff anyway, Trent. And people just ate like apples that had bruising and all that kind of stuff. It would be a totally different world. Uh, if you talk to any grower out here, they'll tell you that's how it should be. <laughs> they'll be like, they'll be like, well, why'd you guys pack my apples so hard? Like, like, like grade them so hard. I could have made money off that. We're like, well, because the buyers won't buy them. They and sometimes they just don't understand that. A bunch of these older guys, because hell, twenty years ago they used to take something that had like a puncture in it and still sell it and and be fine, right? But now you got multi-million dollar packing lines that that literally take like 24 or 25 something pictures of each apple as it goes as it goes by like a second and it gives you a, a like a surface area thing where it can detect bruising, limb rub, scarring, internal rot, insect damage, and stuff like that. So, and now that's just the kind of stuff we've had to adapt because the buyers require stuff like that. So, I would totally be down for that, Nick, and it would make my job a thousand times easier, but there's just not a market for it. <laughs> well, of course, so. we can't make your job easier. We have to, of course, make it harder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those machines are pretty cool. I saw one down here for blueberries. Takes all the pictures and, and automatically sorts them. It's insane. It's like the, the blueberry like, ones are cool. In case yep. anyone's yeah. wondering, uh, for 2020, that. the estimated organic revenue for just the United States, not any other country, is going to be about eighty billion dollars. <laughs> so That's organic a lot of money. definitely got a market. <laughs> I got a, a question for you, Mike. As someone who came from, I guess, the same place I did with uh, <laughs> not the most <laughs> agricultural background. What was like your impression of organics before you like started looking into it? I honestly thought organics was no chemicals and no GMOs, like no genetically modifying, like maybe cross species. Like if you just happen like cross pollinating of different maybe 
you know, apples, since we're talking about apples. But nothing really... It was more preventive, not active measure. So if I planted, say, a row of cucumbers, I, uh, whether it be, you know, just my backyard or... 20 acres. I was simply letting them grow and only letting the strong ones grow. And I imagined I was going to have a large loss. That's why organics cost so much. But I, I had no idea about the acceptable chemicals that were allowed, nor the GMO part really threw me off. That, that when I think organic, for some reason, GMO does not correlate with that word. But I mean, nature is very good at evolving and gym and modifying itself so why is that any different i it's just it's just something that never crossed my mind what about you nick um so yeah like in high school that's kind of what i thought and that's honestly i think we we're i had a environmental sciences class in high school that actually told me that same thing that organic is the way to go and there's no pesticides and then in college i found out the truth and uh my wife she worked at a like i said a fertilizer place and they made organic pesticide or organic fertilizer and it was the same chemical compound just with different the sources of the chemicals was different and now personally i i will look around the store to find conventional products over organic um but that's just that's just me like, and, I, and i could i could see i'm oh, sorry go ahead where you i was gonna say like i like your you're saying you know organics is you take everything that we learned about agriculture and throw it out the window i like to think of it as fly fishing compared to like spin fishing oh. like it's really fun and don't get me wrong i love to go fly fishing but it's not how i want to feed my family if it comes down to it actually i was going to use that example too and i'm really not trying to slam on organics here i mean i have my own opinion on of them but i can understand why people buy them and like i said my growers grow them because they're filling a, a market demand right so i can appreciate them and it's a lot of fun to grow them but <laughs> it's got i, I kind of think about how the covid thing you know at the very beginning started I, I was curious how, many, how much organic products, and for that matter, like all the vegan stuff too, not that they're synonymous, but, you know, we're flying off the shelves when everyone's freaking out. I saw just a bunch of meat and frozen products and conventional stuff getting th getting taken. So that that's all I remember. But And I'm not, like you said, I'm, I'm not trying to dis organic. I actually don't care if people grow organic or not. I just hate the people who buy organic, I think might be the problem. I think they buy organic for the wrong reasons well exactly i think if you yeah. if you want to buy it because you you think it's it's fresher or you or you know what actually most of the time i think a lot of people may get the idea of organic from you know, like the smaller farmers at the farmer market and stuff like that and and people that literally grow it out of their back garden and bring it in on sunday and stuff like that and i could get that i mean you could probably appreciate that that's fresh and not gone through a warehouse or anything like that so maybe a lot of people derive their opinion of organic from that and i can even even commercially, I can see organic being kind of nice. Again, there's not much of a difference between that and conventional, especially when I was talking about the pesticide residue content. I mean, you can spend a little extra money here and there, and you can buy organic. Uh, I know Libby does a little bit, and I don't mind. You know, it's not like I say, oh, well, wasted the money on that. I mean, like, it's, it's kind of interesting to buy it, and it's... I think it's just a different product, and sometimes you feel like buying a different product. I don't see any problem with it. So I have two complicated questions for both of you. I'm going to say the questions, then buy you time for everyone to think what they want to say. One is, if you're forced to grow an organic plant, how would you grow it? And two, where do you see the future or organics happening? Is it just a fad that will fall off to the side? Will it continue to grow? And to bide you all some time to think about your answer, I see organic kind of meeting modern agriculture kind of in the middle. That's where I kind of see organics going, where we're trying to get more renewable, more natural resources, but we have all this knowledge gained from the last 40 50 years of farming to make sure everyone gets fed and it's population increase we're gonna need to feed them so that's where i see the future happening is kind of in the middle and for actual organic farming maybe the mechanical engineer isn't the best person to answer that so i'm hoping one of you two could pick that up i guess you I'm go ahead nick kind of confused with what do you mean how would you grow an organic crop now well say you're an organic farmer now what standards do you put yourself in what do you you put your own spin or an organic now like we mentioned is organic the you know the your backyard zucchini or is organic more what is today with certain chemicals being allowed to use 
how would you run your organic crop? So we establish fire as organic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, think, I think the question you're asking is, what do we think should be should be under the organic label, right? Like, do you think we should allow pesticide usage under organics? Like, if we had an organic farm, would we spray? Or if we had an organic farm, would we do some kind of, like, regenerative, you know, soil treatments or something like that? I think you're complicating the question. I'm just asking okay. what you would do personally. Well, what's the... Not laws or anything. I mean, if I had to grow an organic tree... Let's all right. Uh, does it bear fruit? <clears throat> I, I get where Mike's going, with but it, I don't know though. how to. Yeah, but that really intent. depends on the crop. Like I, I'm not going to tell you how to grow apples because I don't know the pests and my, the cycles and. My question was going to be, what's the market I'm trying to fill? <laughs> I think you're trying to make ends meet. I think you're simplifying agriculture too much. There's too many things we need to know. I'm, I'm no, thinking of like a grower it. trying to make money. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I want. I'm like, all right, you have you're, you have to grow and you have to keep your conscience clear. But well, how would you keep it in the organic category? I mean, Saying there's no this... rules, just in your own mind, what the organic rules you set. I mean, you do the same thing you would now. You'd apply the least amount of inputs that you can to get them the most return back. I mean, you. Nick's not very good at answering this question, so I'm just going to ignore him and pass it on to the uh, next. I think well, I think I kind of get what you're talking about, but uh, you're talking like the actual specific uh, chemicals and stuff I'd use. Probably just probably not raw manure, but more processed manure and then i would probably have to use like more lime and sulfur for for protectants on the tree and stuff like that but that's probably about as far as i go and there's a lot of missing factors in there <laughs> a lot but if i'm trying to grow it in like my idea of what's supposed to be like the aim of organics like fresh and clean and stuff like that's probably what i go with but all right so two things one what manure is used is it cow manure chicken manure what manure is used it can for... uh, i believe it can be any room it can be any um cow or chicken or actually use fish poop too fun fact so i don't know if you call that manure <laughs> but they use it <laughs> so it is technically fertilizer um and uh i don't know which one i'd use though probably just cow manure and going but... back to my second question where do you guys see the future of organics going like i see it as a what we have now with modern or <clears throat> more conventional farming kind of mixed together some, I see a middle ground in between is the future of organics. What about you two? So, Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> oh, thanks, Trent. <laughs> so no I think we're, we're at kind of an interesting crossroads right now for agriculture. And I think, so right now everyone wants all their food to be pesticide-free, GMO-free, or at least maybe that's just what it seems because I live in Oregon. And I don't think that, I think that that in fact is, is not sustainable. We we got here using the technology we had, and if we want to revert back to technology that we previously had in the past and not use anything we invented, then we're going to have to increase acreage, or maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe what we do is we start eating the blemished food like Trent saying we throw out a bunch of food already because it's not perfect if we want to go the more organic route we want to you know produce less per acre then maybe we do something like that you know right now we're seeing a lot of people who everyone's I guess less reliant um, or wants to be less reliant on other people for their food so gardening is really taking off in the time of COVID but I don't see that sustaining I see that being a temporary fad but I do think what that is doing is showing people how it's not easy to just grow all of your food, much less mm -hmm. any, even just growing like a tomato in your backyard. It's more work than people think. And so I think while we're not gaining that independence that people wanted, everyone is gaining a little insight into how hard it is to grow plants. Yep. I think there's been a lot, a, a huge increase in appreciation for the agriculture and production uh, over COVID and stuff like that. But I, I definitely see organics. I don't really see them. I, I see them changing a little bit, but I, I mainly see the organic sector just incorporating more and more until it's basically just conventional again. <laughs> I, I don't mean it fading away, but, but they're just going to keep incorporating more and more and and exceptions for chemicals and such because they're going to start realizing it's, it's just more difficult to produce certain products and certain crops and the price is just going to keep going up not because we want it to i mean there's a premium for it but you know inputs get higher 
And then you're talking about maybe in the future, we're talking about more diesel prices and stuff like that getting higher. And then labor sure as hell in Washington state's getting more expensive. So you're talking about those getting higher. So I think organic either is going to get pushed out or they're just going to get incorporated back into conventional. Yeah, I so. think, and I want to touch on what you said because I don't think people realized exactly how much this costs. So just imagine, like we talked about how with organic, sometimes you have to spray your fields three times compared to the synthetic with one time. You have to run your machine through that field three separate times. You got to pay for all that diesel, which isn't exactly cheap, even though it's not you're using that yeah. off-road tax. <laughs> off-road and you got to pay tax. that guy too. Yeah, and you got to pay the guy to run through it all those times. And so, Mike, that's in the pesticide podcast is like it uses less less CO2. That's where a lot of that's coming from compared to organic. But I, I kind of see right now, like Mikey touched on, the local growers, like, you know, backyard. I got like a pig and a few apple trees and I go to the farmer's market. I really think that that's going to become really big and it's going to get so big that it just becomes conventional agriculture again. Mm-hmm. Because I agree, yeah. So it's going to get, they're like, oh man, I take all my apples and I send them down the farmer's market and sell them. Oh, what if this one guy just took those apples down the farmer's market for me and my neighbor and this other guy and sell them? And then pretty soon you're back to. to (laughs) Then you have a (laughs) co-op. So I actually think, I actually see things playing out more different as Energy, batteries, and electrical motors become more prominent. I can see diesels eventually falling to the wayside. Now, this might be 25 years, but we're still going to be eating in 25 years and farming in 25 years. At least I hope so. So I can see now the diesel costs going significantly down, so that doesn't matter. And I imagine as our technology improves and we understand more the DNA sequences of different species, pesticides, insects, and we simply just learn because, hell, I mean, 40 years ago from farming then to now is, is light years difference. I imagine we're going to learn more about what we're growing and how to protect it and and how to harvest a more bountiful yield. So I imagine we're going to be using less to begin with. So I can I don't necessarily agree that it's going to go straight to what we have as modern conventional farming. I think organic still going to be stay put, but I think it's going to kind of collide. So conventional farming, organic farming, again, I think are going to meet in the middle. I think there's going to be a common ground in between them, which will be the new conventional farming. I don't see organic completely disappearing. And uh, I, I, I agree with both of you. It'd be a shame not to use the conventional farm that we've spent so many years and decades learning not to use. But as technology improves, I think we need to I think we'll be able to use less to gain more. And I, yeah. I think you're right in a sense. Like we are gaining, you know, the knowledge from the organic industry of what they're doing and how they're doing it. And the question is going to become like, okay, so what if we find out, you know, biological control is just as effective? Well, then it's very quickly going to become common practice. You know, it's it, farmers want also, to save money. Also, take everything right? I said with a grain of salt because I'm a fool with a capital F. Just want to point that out. There. Yeah, well, <coughs> I'm also grow trees for lumber not apples or consumption or any kind of fun fruit thing like that so but yeah I, I i do think that it's going to be like you said it's going to combine and uh, we can see it right now trent i mean i think we've seen it in college and everyone's more focused on just being sustainable and it's not like uh you guys are going out there like hey let's let's mess up the soil i mean one of the soil health is is pretty important mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yes yes, yes. I mean, it's not like conventional guys look at soil and like, nah, we don't need that. <laughs> like, like soil fertility is just as important. I was I was going to pick you back off what Mike said about, you know, in the future, you know, people are going to have to eat. And another factor you have to put in there is the fact that, what are we supposed to be at, 10 billion people by the turn of the century? Or is that, or is I think that... by 2030, we're supposed to be at 11 billion. No, by 2030? 2030 or 2050, I believe, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't <laughs> Thanks, know. <China>. I... <laughs> But, but, you know, that's that's something you have to think about, too. Is, is organic production going to be able to take us that far? Is it going to be able to produce that much for 11 billion people that soon? I mean, I, 
like I said, it's got its own advances and, and, and that organic has definitely got its own progress and research going on. And I, I think they're pretty formidable, but again, I, I think they're just going to get put back into conventional very slowly and kind of just phase by the wayside. If we, if we want to look at feeding 11 billion people. So I think it's just going to become a label that used to be. And I can't believe it, but I found a way to fit it in space. So I have to oh, take me, this is going to take me way off topic, but we've been talking about trees for so long. I got to bring it's it okay. back. I've been waiting to go off topic. <laughs> <laughs> As we explore space, do you think organic farming will be colonizing amongst the planets? Like I imagine the first, let's say, five generations of a Martian, no way organics are going to exist. But are we going to allow organic farming on other planets once we colonize them? I guess I should have listened to the full episode of the Martian colonization, huh? I am full. I am oh, full on. Let's go to space. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, 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 I almost think it's the same as on Earth, except it magnified, right? You're in space. It's for survival. You're going to need to use whatever system, whether it be organic or conventional, that uses the least inputs. That you right. get the most bang for yep. the buck. I yep. disagree with that. Okay, I, so pack I, me, all that extra pesticide in there. No, 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 not for the space part, but for Earth part. Like, Earth part, it's not all about survival. And I imagine once... I mean, I agree with you for space part, it's going to be for survival, but... I imagine within five generations, and we're, once we're colonized space, it's not going to be just survival. We're going to be bougie. I mean, we're Americans. We want it bigger, larger, and now. Hell, I'm a Texan. I, of course I want it bigger. Now, but th is that the same I can't for our egg? He could use it a lot. I was going to say, where's the context on that? <laughs> can't win. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> but no, if we colonize, like, Europa... And we've been there for five generations. Eventually, we're going to want luxury items. Is organic going to fit that niche? Is organic a good idea? Like, is when you're living in the quarters, I, I imagine, all right, so imagine, we'll, we'll bring it back down to Earth. If you're on a Navy ship for X amount of years, I imagine some sailors have got to have, like, small little cactuses or plants on their uh, in their quarters. And I imagine that'd be the same in space, but instead of, you know, growing a flower or a cactus, you're growing a tomato plant or a, a, a something small like chives or green onions or something right yeah but there's a difference between growing that for yourself and growing that to feed a population i i think it's the beginning stages of growing to feeding a population but i think, I think so this is where we're at in the org and as americans we're so privileged to be able to say this is how i want my food grown mm -hmm. so agreed if you're if we live in space long enough where we don't need to like each harvest isn't life or death then we're doing pretty good and then yeah we can start venturing out because you don't get innovation without risks right so yeah for that fact once you have enough stored energy stored food resources then yeah then it's time to start experimenting and maybe it is like a luxury item but you're not going to start creating luxury items until you are pretty sure you're not going to starve to death. So what I'm hearing, Nick, is you agree that organic farming will eventually make it to space, which means that will happen in the future, which means you believe organic farming will keep existing on. I, w I want to so, know the price of uh, organic tomato plant in space be s being sold on Earth with inflation, please. I guess what <laughs> Let's I'm do that. Is... Let's just grow food in space and send it back to Earth. I guarantee you that will make millions. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. No, what I'm, I'm, when I'm, I'm substituting the word organic, what I'm basically saying is growing plants on hard difficulty or legendary difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's accurate. Which is essentially like we covered in the, the Mars podcast, which is what growing plants in space is going to be. Gonna yeah, it's going to be rough. Legendary, all skulls on. Well, what the hell happens when, when you like the sun? The sun's different, and it is there like certain times that the plants can't really perform photos, photosynthesis as compared oh, to Earth. Trent, you're That's gonna what have I'm to thinking. Listen to it because fun, okay. fun fact: you get like I think 33 percent less light, so a lot of plants wouldn't even make it in space. We'd have to oh, add radiation. additional lighting, as well as we'd have to heat up the greenhouse of some sorts. It's almost the light you would get on Mars is almost not even worth having exterior windows. Oh my god! I guess we're growing fucking mushrooms. Much. <laughs> But I am curious about your opinion, Trent, about farming in space. Do you see it eventually turning organic, or do you see it just being conventional and always conventional in space? If it's going to be organic, it's going to be a ways out. It's going to be a long ways out. It's going to be when, after we're done being bougie on Earth, it's going to be when we're bougie on Mars. So 
and then move to the next freaking planet. It, it's just because it, it, organics just like again, it's it's just not your first thing you go to. You're gonna go that you, you're gonna go the path of least resistance, and that is conventional. That's that's just the way it's gonna be for a couple of years. I think organics got its place again, but I think like I said during COVID, no one took organic off the shelves. <laughs> but it's you know conventional is just the just the easiest one to live off of. I think good to know. And in case anyone's wondering, it costs ten thousand dollars for a pound of food sent to the International Space Station. So imagine how much money, gentlemen, we could make if we grew some small plant in space and sent it back to Earth as the not organic but spatially grown plants. A whole new market. <clears throat> Costs ten thousand dollars per pound to send yeah. food to space. I think you have to get what, like fifty-six thousand either kilometers or miles per hour off the earth to get off the earth so yeah every every pound kind of matters okay so trent i have one question for you if you could grow any variety of apple in space what do you think would be the i guess the better question is what do you think would be the best variety to grow in space mm, god that's gonna that's gonna be tough I, I would typically choose a pink lady because it's so freaking hardy and i feel like we'd probably be dealing with colder temperatures yeah, but it's gonna be it's, it's going to be colder. It, you may have more nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're going to have less light. And how do apples deal with radiation? Is my question. I don't know. That's well, a good question. A question. But I, my next my next thought around. was <laughs> my next question was it, it's it's going to get less light up there too, probably right? Yeah. Or it so depends that's on where something we're at. that it, we're it seems like people are kind of unsure about. Of I mean, I think we're just going to have to substitute and just do synthetic lighting for the entire <laughs> time because. The Martian, like summer, isn't uh, is not the same as on Earth, so we wouldn't have a whole, I guess, growing season uh, without supplementing it. I was gonna say you're gonna make me start doing like get the degree unit calculator out and everything, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the the pink ladies would be my first option. But then again, they they're the apple that takes the longest to mature. Like after a full bloom, they take like, oh god, they full bloom right now, and I'll pick them in November. <laughs> So, Jesus. Uh, like the Over last week in November. So I, I'm just thinking about how much longer it's going to take to grow pink lady. It's going to be like three years. <laughs> well, yeah. Just in, in term. The first crops on Mars are going to be like chilies or something that one growing season, and it's easy to pick. Nothing like not potatoes or anything that you have to mm -hmm. get dirt off of and prepare. You just want to pick it off the plant and eat it. So, unfortunately, I looked this up, Trent. It's going to take a long time after colonization to start growing trees, whether it be apples or lumber for absolutely no reason at all. You don't need lumber in space, which is... You're telling me a wood house won't protect you. <laughs> yeah, I can only... My product only sells on Earth. <laughs> well, you're hosed. There goes your there goes your job in space. Yep. And to think I to think I thought I was born in the wrong time frame, but here I am, still able to grow trees. <laughs> yeah. A, no. Go ahead, Mike. Oh no, I'm gonna take us way off topic. So you should probably. Oh, because first. we were on topic. Really. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I was just wondering because you're thinking, making me think about space food, and al uh, algae is a big space food. Is there organic algae? I think they and... use algae in organic agriculture. <laughs> it's well, like I, well, as like a can... as like an application, but so I think you mis misunderstood us, Mike. I grow trees, and Trent grows also trees <laughs> with fruit on them. <laughs> with fruit on them. Well, Nick, does it? Are, 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 do Trent you... grows a little bit. Some trees that evolved a little bit after my trees. Actually, Nick, do do conifers and and actually, what, what's the other one? It's yeah, conifers and deciduous trees. Thank you. I was struggling with the word. <laughs> all but but uh, they technically have fruit though yes. don't they yeah, because you have yes. to that's still that's still um procreation right they right. have it's seeds just in not there. the fruit that we you can't eat it right is the pine is a pine cone technically a fruit I believe so that's where uh where the uh the mating happens i guess you oh, could this, say. yeah the seeds are kept in there too right yeah so. and then you have spores okay. that come out or i guess seeds that come out mm -hmm. that, nick i'll give you a dollar to eat a pine cone we're going to talk about supply and demand here real quick <laughs> <laughs> how many dollars do i have versus how many dollars do i need and how many pine cones do i want to eat i was going to say you got to take out the fact you got to factor out how much time you're going to spend on the toilet so that's going to take <laughs> out your production time what if i uh I know. What if I eat like um, a juniper cone or something really small? I don't know small. what that looks I like. I mean, it's essentially like a little bit bigger than like a ibuprofen tablet. Wow, really? That's tiny. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> God damn it! 
Oh, Mike, so I maybe I won't go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> nope. So, Mike, what do you think about organics in space? I mean, do you think that after, after hearing our expert opinions as both growers of organic and spacemen... <laughs> So my all right. One, I want to say I did a quick search on organic algae. Like nothing came up. So I don't. Our algae might be already organic just by itself. But how I see, uh, I'm seeing long term. So maybe 25 generations. Each market is going to be planetarial based. So I don't. See see the same terms we use for organic and conventional farming on earth the same going to be on europa or venus i imagine those two are going to be very different worlds on a what's grown how it's grown what even looks or tastes like i i imagine 10 years later because based on what soy you have it's going to change the taste of it after so many generations it's it's going to adapt and change so i imagine the organic market for venus is going to be look very different than organic on earth maybe organic Organic meaning on Venus means it's simply more Earth-like. May not eat, not depending on how it's grown, but simply where it's grown is more organic. I, maybe I don't know. It's a um, puzzling question that I'm hoping I'll be allowed to see. Well, I think it's kind of like what I was saying of you're substituting organic, but what essentially you're saying is growing crops on hard difficulty. So growing them like trying to grow them to Earth specifications or growing them in a certain environment. And I think that what I think uh, you're kind of touching on why. Why this is so uh not quite but why this is such a heated topic of the growers and those guys seeing like what goes into organic but the i think what you're touching on is the disconnect between the people who grow and who the people who consume it and so what you want is you want a superior good and you don't quite know what that is you know whether it be a good that's grown to earth-like specifications or that's grown on what if you bring up earth soil and that's like the new commodity you know this is like an apple tree grown in 100% earth soil. That's like the new organic in space. But earth soil is going to react different in space. I mean, one thing that, like Trent, we were touching on in the Martian one is just you'd have to bring up specific soils for crops in space just to get all that, you know, the microorganisms in that soil that help that plant grow. Oh, yeah. Not and, to mention trying to adjust for pH. Good God. <laughs> yeah, and then keep all them alive. And, but I think it's almost like uh, it's not really about the crops. It's about like a, a status symbol of something, you know, keeping up with the joneses you're getting the uh oh i'm getting that earth apple or i'm getting that you know organic stuff it's to some people i feel like it, it might be that way and i think again like we talked about previously it's because people in the united states me included super fucking lucky for so many reasons but one our agriculture i mean just think about it we don't consume food that's blemished not bad not moldy not whatever just blemished <laughs> i mean can you imagine telling some people in the world that and i'm guilty of it too some i'll i look at the apples and i pick the nicest ones and that's just how i've always done it and i know it's like i try now that like i'm not an actual like know a little bit about it i'll try and buy a little bit more blemished ones just to like because i know no one else will but in i think think organic is is that is that we're so far disconnected from what it takes to grow which i think is what we were talking about how people growing their own food is going to change that because it's not as easy as, as people think but i do think mike what you're hitting on is that what will be the next status symbol of food and i think that's a question I'd like to throw to you guys is not organic but the next trendy food topic i mean maybe it's pesticide free or gmo free but what do you guys <coughs> think is the next i mean trent you probably know this better looking at markets like what's next oh hell it's probably going to be food produced without fossil fuels <laughs> to be completely honest yeah, with you that was quick <laughs> and honestly a pretty good fucking answer <laughs> I mean, just look at the trends going on, though. I mean, it, the organic thing, you know, it's big, but now we're really entering more of a, everyone wants to be done with gas and diesel by 2030. So it's the next new trend that people are looking at. Um, but I mean, honestly, that's, that's probably what it's going to be. And then how the hell you, <laughs> you have to have the whole certification process and stuff for that, too. It'll probably happen. I wouldn't doubt it. So what about I you, unfortunately Mike? You got have weird to ideas. I unfortunately have to follow that up. And uh, the only thing that comes to my mind is uh, food that doesn't exist anymore. So like everyone knows the banana taste, like banana taste of candy doesn't taste like the bananas today. So maybe there's a whole new food market that's on food that used to exist, like through DNA sequencing, we regrow certain plants that were prehistoric or that don't exist anymore. Like uh, I, for some reason, I'm bringing it back to meat because maybe because I'm just hungry. But like we get some stem cells from dodo birds and grow that into burgers so you can have dodo burgers or oh my god oh, I'm <laughs> so down 
I, I, am, I get take my money. Shut up. <laughs> take my money. <laughs> That's uh, I can kind of see that going on where you can have food that no longer exists. And I, I feel like that's a very easy selling point. Like, hey, you want something that doesn't exist anymore? Come eat and try this. I'd yeah. be down for Dodo well, Burger. Well, didn't um, there was uh, someone found, I'm assuming in Russia, because this seems a very Russian story. They found a mammoth and they took tissue samples and examined the sub, you know, everything. But then afterwards they had all this meat left over so they paid like people paid i don't even know what price was but you could have mammoth steak Did you hear that Peta has that, got to be losing its shit that 100 <laughs> percent sounds like russia exactly you got mammoths and Ru- your mammoth skeletons in russia that's where something like this would occur i mean putin is essentially every single bond villain i mean it's perfect oh my god yeah wait so they, they grew they grew the meat i like the tissue so you're talking no, kind of like no. how they did they, the, they so ate the, frozen tissue so the 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 oh, whole mammoth God. froze, whether and it's maybe like fell in a bog or something, and then it froze over. But everything was pretty much preserved, and so they, you know, once it became uncovered, they did the excavation, took tissue samples, hair samples, examined the stomach contents, took all the measurements, and then they were just like had this mammoth, and they're like, "What are we gonna do with it?" And the Russians were like, huh, "Well, we're hungry." <laughs> always hungry <laughs> and so a bunch of rich people in russia ate it i'm assuming it's russia i can't remember it just it a lot of money <laughs> that it was russia <laughs> there's got to be i just think about like the food safety concerns with meat nowadays and and then i'm thinking like how do you know it was on that meat before it froze <laughs> And I don't so, know. It's so Trent. This is it's like obviously. botulism times ten. <laughs> God, prehistoric botulism. I don't Ooh, know if I you have... listened to the space episode. Real, I'll, it's a quick story, Mike. So Russia grew a bunch of spinach in space, and so did the United States. And the United States sent the spinach back down to Earth to be like tested to ensure it was safe. And the Russian cosmonauts just ate it like right in space. <laughs> and they were like, "Wait, you guys are testing this first? <laughs> <laughs> for radiation and shit like that. Yeah, it's a classic Probably. Russian. I think you're Russian. <laughs> the U.S. spinach did test like safe, but you know Russia well, doesn't. Well, care. now the Russians know. <laughs> <laughs> we knew before, like the Ru- the Russians that probably ate it in front of the Americans were like cute pussies. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing: the spinach could be completely contaminated, and still probably wouldn't have killed the Russians. So <laughs> they'd be true. like, "That is good." <laughs> <laughs> it's more food than I ever got. <laughs> spinach. <laughs> Oh, God. You were saying something, Mike? Oh, I want to add on to another trend I can see happening very soon. So certain meat and beef, and uh, I think it's, I can't remember the name of it, uh, certain cheeses as well, where they allow bacteria or it to rot to a certain point and then cook it and eat it. I can see the same thing happening with vegetables. Like you take a <coughs> pumpkin and you let it sit and you sprinkle some bacteria or yeast on it and let it decay a little bit before cooking it or eating it. I can see that being another trend as well. Well, like a bougie, you, rotten, yeah. eaten food. Are you kind of talking about like how they age salumis? I like don't salami know and, and, and other Italian meats is they, they have bacteria on the outside of them and they put them in the, in the in not a cooler, but it's literally an aging room. And they'll leave them in there for weeks. I did and not it, know this, but I was thinking like the Japanese beef where they like they hang out and like they have to scrape off the mold from the top layer before cooking it or like certain mm-hmm. cheeses they let they like make holes in it and like, like let maggots run through it and like yeah it's the same concept yeah i can i can see that happening to vegetables and fruit very quickly so my question is you've met americans right me yes and so these same people who flip a shit if they get a pickle they order not on their burger are gonna allow people to put <laughs> maggots and stuff in their food yeah, yeah. Typically, yeah. I try to keep bacteria out of my orchard, but that's just me. But. I don't know. I, I mean, I see that as being like a niche. I just can't imagine that's going to become mainstream. But I, mainstream and trend are two different things. That's well, they that's true. They don't even let they don't even pack apples that fall on the orchard ground because of listeria. <laughs> so wait, hold up. They don't let apples be packed if they fall on the ground. No, there's listeria on on the ground. It's it's naturally occurring. It's just it, it it's not on the trees, but it'll be in the in like the orchard grass or on the on the, in the dirt like what do you do with those apples because i'll eat them uh they just leave them on the ground that hurts my soul yeah well i mean and a bunch of apples fall off during wind and wind storms and stuff like that too and they just have to leave them or they, they'll incorporate them back into the ground right i mean they're gonna rot they're still nutrients but yeah that hurts my soul I, i'm not gonna lie i'm a big fan of fruit like i eat some type of fruit daily and apples and peanut butter is like my go-to snack so just hearing apples rotten on the ground granted they're I, you are right they are going back to the nutrition plant i mean you're 
far more an expert than I am. But still, I'm like, food, food being wasted. I want food. That's true. No, I get that, too. I hate wasting food. Did, did you eat dinner today, Mike? I did. I actually have had, like, four meals a day. Oh, well, might, you're in I Texas, be... so you're still two meals shy of a four. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Fat Trent's got to make his way over to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Fat, Fat Trent. Trent. No. So um, I think yep. we touched a large range of topics for organic. We've gone from what actually happens to the possibility of space organics and i'll be honest i'm at a loss now i'm all upside down and i i'm not quite sure where to go from here i don't have anything else trent you got anything you want to add no i'm good i i uh i think going off your guys opinions it sparked a lot of good conversations so if you have anything you want to add you can hit us up on Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and YouTube. Trent, if you want to share your social media or your company or whatever, if not, no worries. I mean, you can bother me at TJ Craig Johnson. That's my Instagram handle. But that's it. Yeah. Don't contact me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone spam him. Just, I just, I just, just now, I we have to. Just ask, I swear to God. Yeah, just <laughs> ask him uh, what apples would you grow in space. And, and all the information, and all the information I talked about in organics is completely available. It's all public information on the USDA organics page. So if you get a wild hair, I had to drink a couple beers to get through it, but <laughs> go, go for it. Well, that's anything the government makes. <laughs> yeah, no, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, guys. Sounds good. Before we get out of here, Mike, what books are you reading? I'll go, I'm currently reading uh, Deep Survival, The Science of Who Lives and Who Dies and Why. Basically just explores different survival situations and who survives. And a lot of the times it doesn't come down to experience. It a lot of times comes down to genetics. And good old-fashioned luck. And to answer your question, Nick, I am reading The Lean Startup by Eric Rise. Uh, it's actually a lot light, lighter read from going from from Fountainhead to Dune to now a book I can skim through, so I'm very Oh my excited. god, you went through Fountainhead? Jesus. Yeah. What about you, Trent? Are you reading anything? Yeah, well, I can't read. Nick knows that. No. <laughs> He's not wrong. I'm reading... I, I struggle through. No, I'm 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 reading Cyclops by Clive Cussler. He's kind of a. Uh, it's 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 fiction. It's it's historical fiction. I'm a um, huge Clive Cussler fan. So yeah. yeah. What is what is that book about Cyclops? I, I it's like uh, it's it's it's, it's like Mediterranean um, one with the uh, the ship with the sail. No, right? Cyclops is the uh, yeah the, it, yeah. Did it's it's got the tornado it? part in it and everything. Yeah. Okay. Sounds you, good. Mike, you for your information. Any of my questions. For, for for, for information, Mike, it is a book about like a naval uh, research. Is it a company technically, Nick, or is it like a, I can't remember. So NUMA, National Underwater Marine Agency, is a government organization that is essentially a combination of our NOAA or our um, Coast Guard and like uh, NOAA or, and like a marine biology agency. They do everything from you know, shipwreck preservation to studies on endangered species. And then they also stop terrorism, <laughs> There's a lot of shooting terrorists in all the books. <laughs> yeah. A lot of shooting America. terrorists. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you have <clears throat> marine biology, you have history, you have old cars, and you have a spy thriller, essentially. Well, there, there's sorry. one also, Mike, where the handicapped dude takes his leg off and kills someone with it, so you should enjoy it. I am 100% sold. Need to add those to my list now. <laughs> That's the one Juan, Juan Cabrillo series, by the way, Nick. Ah, uh, gotcha. So, Nick, if they wanted to tell us what, about their opinions on organic farming, where can they find us? You can find us on Instagram and YouTube, but you cannot find us on Twitter. Why can't you find us on Twitter? Because even though people have said that or that conventional agriculture has destroyed this planet, nothing will ever destroy this planet as much as Twitter has. <laughs> oh. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> <Forever. laughs> I didn't get a rumph out of that guy. <laughs> 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 Well, I had fun this episode, gentlemen, and hopefully, Trent, we'll have you back on very soon. And as yeah, always, thanks, guys. thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram.